something that I alluded to yesterday because big data offers profound opportunities for insight into for, for advancing system science. It's key to this vision, these elements that I just articulated. Um, and uh, big data sources are good as points of reference um, for, for understanding the value brought by, um, uh, by uh, data science, but they also motivate many of the analytics strategies um, uh, associated with, uh, with machine learning help motivate those. So I had argued yesterday that evidence on many spheres is traditionally hard to reliably elicit using um, uh, traditional instruments. Um, and self-reporting um, is burdensome often, but it's often uh, fraught because of uh, limited uh, capacity to recall and other aspects of recall bias. At the same time, in many spheres of public health and, and epidemiology, traditionally available survey data is harder to secure. Some of our work with smartphones and wearables has been catalyzed by the growing challenges associated, for example, with random digit dialing telephone surveys, which has been a mainstay for population-wide assessment with surveys over many decades. Random digit dialing um, while it's been pursued as an attempt to, to get a, um, a fairly representative sample from populations, uh, increasingly it's becoming non-representative with fewer people answering the phone, those who do answer the phone being um, not of representative ages and, and demographic groups for the broader population. Uh, it also tends, correspondingly, to be very effective, uh, very expensive, because of the need to, to uh, because of the inefficiencies increasingly caught up in it. There's a proliferation of content channels, um, which means that uh, uh, that it's harder to reach potential respondents for surveys um, using newspaper ads or or uh, advertisements on radios. Um, and it's difficult to secure reliable information on many important subgroups of the population, including vulnerable populations, say homeless people, um, those in, in rural and remote areas, youth, um, and, and groups that, whose connectivity is, is, is limited. So the perspective I'm going to offer here um, uh, is going to allude for the ways that smartphones can, and, and associated wearables that often accompany them, can provide ways of, of, of offering rich insight into health information, provide um, into to health behaviors, uh, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and exposures, can provide us with a way of understanding the influences on those um, on those health beliefs, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and exposures, those, those behaviors, and, and finally, can serve to nudge those behaviors as well. Um, so this, um, this uh, line of work is motivated in many ways by the unique, the fact that smartphones and wearables uniquely straddle between two worlds, each of which is of great and growing interest within the sphere of health, health services delivery, and health care. And those are, on the one hand, the physical world, our surrounding environment, aspects of our built environment, our food environment, um, and, uh, and components of our exposure to hazardous chemicals or contamination in air and water, food, etc. So there's the physical world. But there's also the electronic world. And the electronic world, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it could have been excused as a fairly minor player within the health sphere. But these days, I would argue, the, what goes on in the electronic world is of profound, needs to be front and center in conversations of sources of evidence when it comes to health for several reasons. One of the reasons is that 
just as we cast shadows in the real world um, that reflect the light levels, in the electronic world, we have a digital shadow of sorts. We're casting into the digital world evidence on an ongoing basis about our health status, aspects of our health behaviors, um, and, and things that help us understand our health exposures. For example, where we're located, whether it's within an area of LA that's higher, has higher levels of airborne um, particulate matter at a given time, or uh, to what degree uh, we are subject to an adverse physical environment as far as uh, physical activity, walkability, etc. The evidence for our locations, for our contact patterns, our social support networks, are increasingly fall within the electronic world as much as they fall within the physical world. So one reason is we're casting these electronic shadows. If we stay at home sick or if we're feeling stressed, that comes out within the electronic world as much as it does in the physical world. At the same time, the electronic world influences our health as well. Um, our attitudes, knowledge, beliefs, the health information we rely on often is obtained by the electronic world. What we browse to to find information on a new potential diagnosis explaining some of our symptoms or to alleviate a side effect of a drug. That information lives in, in most part now in the electronic world. Our health seeking, our inf health information seeking, the communicational behavior that we engage in is up in the external world. Much of our social support networks are communicated with the electronic world. So the electronic world is one where we cast a digital shadow, but it's also one where we are influenced in terms of our decision making, our knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and ultimately our behaviors and exposures due to aspects of electronic influence. But it's not merely that. Increasingly, our understanding of the physical world and our activities in the physical world is mediated by the electronic world. So when it comes to understanding how many steps I've taken today, where do I turn to? Am I counting them manually? Of course not. I go and I, I will use my wearable and I'll, I'll check my step counts or I'll use my Android phone and I'll say thus far 1882 steps with my phone. I didn't have it with me on my run today, but my, my watch picked it up. And it comes to the point of, of saying that increasingly my understanding of my health behaviors in the physical world is, is informed by, it, it, it's fed to me through electronic data sources, right? I go and I check my sleep patterns over the last month um, through, through electronic means. I perhaps keep a food diary of what I've eaten, right? Uh, perhaps I track my use of the gym. Perhaps I record my bike trips on Endomondo and share them with the world. Perhaps I go and, and capture aspects associated with my, uh, my, my uh, socialization patterns or my uh, use of, of uh, physical activity resources or my sedentary behavior. And I read about, and I, and I understand those through virtues of interactions in the external, the electronic world. Um, sometimes I might be interested in the degree to which I have been subject to certain risk, um, certain risks, maybe it's um, risk of exposure to certain um, high levels of, of particulate matter uh, during the last day, and I'll check online the, uh, the air quality index, or I'll check the UV index outside today for what risk I'll be associated with. Do I, do I need to put on, um, uh, put on um, sunscreen to protect myself? All of that goes through the electronic world these days. So the electronic world, even as much as we interact with the physical world for many of our risk factors, for our behaviors and exposures, our understanding of them is mediated by this electronic world. At the same time, of course, 
we do circulate in the physical world, and many risks are associated with that. So we engage in driving behavior, we, we uh, move from one place to another, we are in, activi in activity spaces that welcome um, uh, lower levels of sedentary behavior because of standing desks or walking desks, um, the capacity to have walking paths, et cetera, uh, within the physical world. We're in a sphere where we can get healthier foods or where we're subject to to buying uh, Tim Tams and uh, floaters, uh, floaties at, um, in, uh, in, in terms of convenience stores uh, uh, together with uh, meat pies, if we're in Australia. Um, we are subject in the physical world to marketing. Um, some of that marketing is electronic, uh, increasing amounts, but some of that marketing is physical based. In the states, it includes billboards, advertising tobacco products, or advertising uh, e-cigarettes, or cigarettes, or, or alcohol. It might include um, uh, promotion of fast food as well, or other components. And that is, is advertising we may encounter in the physical world as well as in the electronic world. Who we spend time with, under what levels of physical activity and sedentary behavior, where we are in our mobility patterns. These are things which uh, are kept track of the physical world. And the smartphone, once again, accompanies us in our toings and froings within this physical world. Um, smartphones straddle these two worlds. And by virtue of straddling, they can pick up information on these two worlds. They can track over time elements of our exposures, elements of our interactions, elements of those shadows we cast, and elements of those influences upon us. And that puts smartphones and wearables in an almost unique position to inform an understanding of what's going on with us health-wise, what the influences are that are driving many of those aspects of health, behavior, knowledge, attitudes, belief, and exposures, and to nudge them themselves if used as an intervention vehicle. So the tool which we've explored for years, um, it's been around now in some form for about a decade, um, and is now used by over 100 studies worldwide um, with its predecessors uh, well more than that, um, is this tool Ethica. And, and Ethica is a tool that leverages smartphones and now wearables and the web as well for configuring uh, studies, each of which can be associated with a semi-custom interface, can specify for that study, if configured by a researcher without programming, the data sources they want to use, which sensors, for example, recognizing the screen state of the phone, uh, recognizing aspects of uh, step count over time, GPS location, and aspects perhaps of, uh, of, of uh, a person's social contacts with other participants. We can deliver surveys defined graphically in a survey monkey type um, interface or Google Forms and other activities such as chats, uh, chat with, say, uh, study organizers, um, uh, time use tracking, activity tracking, or expense tracking, um, and, uh, and other components that involve uh, active uh, participant interaction. So studies can be bundled up like this in a semi-custom interface. Uh, increasingly, the customization can be richer. And then deployed to smartphones or to the web. And there's a rich web interface that's now available for uh, people to interact with, uh, participants to interact with the web uh, if they wish to do so, or via smartphones. Um, wearables are also another mode of bringing data back, and Ethica supports a wide variety of wearables in the form of uh, Google Fit. This data can be collected from participants over time and include surveys and these data sources collected with low burden behind the scenes and can be brought back to a researcher dashboard where the researcher can analyze the data, visualize it, and, um, and export it for analysis uh, additionally using other tools. Um, why would we use such a system like this? What are some of the key use cases? Well, I've listed some here. 
One is the desire for lower burden and more accurate self-reporting. So the ability to allow people with, um, with a web-based um, interface or with smartphones to, um, in lightweight ways with these kind of micro surveys, these ecological momentary assessments, to, to share information concerning certain aspects of their situation. They can be prompted or they can press a button to, to proactively indicate I'm sick or I'm feeling or I'm eating right now or I'm taking my medication, et cetera. So self-reporting um, in a convenient fashion electronically is a big goal and to make that uh, simple and um, seamless during the day. Why low burden? Well, there's a couple reasons. One thing, we can pick up a lot of information that otherwise they'd have to report. For example, where they're located right now what sort of sedentary behavior they might have been engaged in, who they're with in terms of other participants. Uh, these things could be picked up by phone sensors and linked with their data without them having to report it. So if you're in a facility and concerned with health services delivery, they're in a long-term care facility, um, or in a ward of a hospital perhaps, um, this is someone reporting who's, who's a staff member, and we can pick up automatically they're in close proximity of the pill cart. Or we can pick up that a veteran is close to their service dog and has been recently. Another reason, very important, is that we can trigger surveys that are triggered by the proximity to a certain resource. So maybe it's by proximity to a service dog. Or once they haven't been near the service dog, for a certain length of time, we'll ask a question about uh, barriers to that. Um, so we can ask questions that are temporarily proximate to the situation and that are subject to less recall bias, um, but we can do so often because we can trigger these questionnaires uh, in, a, in a thoughtful, uh, timely fashion. Um, there's also the ability to, for example, divide it up into a bite-sized instrument or uh, proactively report it on the part of the, um, the part of the participants. Those are a couple broad features. And often one gets greater accuracy. The veracity is higher because you're not asking to recall over the past quarter of a year or a year how much they ate fresh fruits and vegetables, but on a, a basis of a couple times a week where it's, it's less of a challenge to recall and to aggregate it in their mind, um, to, to mentally aggregate these, uh, these ideas. Um, Audiovisual representation, our capacity to take a video or take a photo can often provide a lot more accuracy in communicating what we've seen uh, than, than a self-report. And even for things like food may offer certain Certain, um, uh, certain, a certain additional understanding for the researcher. As time goes on, we search for ways of trying to offer this that could quantify volume, for example, or size of an offering. For example, by waving a phone over it and doing 3D reconstruction of likely size of a portion. Um, there are other cases in which uh, you can use uh, audiovisual recording in order to capture aspects of a situation that you want a confirmation of. For example, is this person indeed taking their uh, highly active retro antiretroviral um, uh, pill uh, every day? They take a photo of it when they uh, are taking it, and it's out of its blister pack, and you're, you have some confidence they've taken it. Or the rifampin for latent TB protection. Um, so we have. We have a physical photo that confirms that, you know, uh, there's, there's something being taken here. Um, sort of directly observed, um, uh, directly observed therapy um, analogy. Another use of these phones is to assess outcomes. To assess outcomes, say, if a patient reported outcomes uh, study or exposures um, along particular causal pathways. Um, so we talked yesterday about these, this picture of 
bathing, for example. Um, in terms of outcomes, occurrences of highly credible gastrointestinal illness, but risk factors to which they were subject, levels of enterococcus, uh, indicator organism, and um, the, um, the regulatory side of it in terms of beach closure. We can get a picture over time of, of Lyme disease or of, of a, veteran's, um, a veteran's story, as it were, over time in terms of various factors and outcomes, including, say, use, use of um, uh, substance use or in terms of suicidal ideation. Um, pharmaceuticals, I mentioned. Um, some aspects of our situation are, as I've noted, hard to gather otherwise. Um, I've noted this several times. When we can record things using sensor data, there's a lot of ways we can, in a low burden fashion, capture some of this information. Let's say location information here, right? Um, we can capture that in terms of people's toings and froings over a geographic area. This uh, from excellent work pursued by Li Xiaoyan um, and uh, in conjunction with Harvard collaborators. Um, so we can capture participants' movement over different activity spaces. Uh, we can also capture things like physical activity, uh, so, uh, spatial proximity of different participants fairly easily. Um, another, another gain is enhancing the speed reliability and depth of learning from implemented interventions. I argued that models can help with this. Models can help us reason about why we saw certain effects from an intervention. Models are all about, the dynamic models we build here are all about why, right? They're about the mechanism, the, the, underlying, the underlying generative pathways that give rise to the data we see. That's what dynamic modeling and, and system science modeling are about depicting. But here, we see that the same triad of features applies uh, within the sphere of smartphone-based data collection. Um, so we can understand effects um, across different pathways. And these are the examples I used before, but they carry over to phone use at particularly strong examples. So we can evidence sources of, of change that are quite specific across pathways. I emphasized this point earlier, but it's an area where smartphones and wearables shine because using different data sources from Ethica, we can figure out, are they using the, health, you know, the, the food stores? Are they still going to convenience stores in their new area, mixed income neighbor, uh, neighborhood of the city? Are they out walking at night? We can query their perceived safety of the surrounding environment using smartphones. We can see, are they using the recreational spaces? Are they out walking? How much moderate, vigorous physical activity are they getting? How much sedentary behavior are they getting? How much time are they actually spending at home? This is one of the hypotheses researchers advance, that maybe teenage girls in the new neighborhood with, fam with uh, friendship networks l largely, um, uh, largely uh, you know, related to the old neighborhood um, far away, maybe they're spending more time at home eating food at home and uh, rather than out, out uh, in restaurants with friends and so on, and maybe that leads to lower obesity levels. Well, we can test that, right? We can look at our teenage boys as hypothesized, still going back to the old hood and spending time with out of parental supervision range uh, in the old neighborhood getting into trouble, and that's why pro-criminal involvement is being changed. We can look at, at aspects of, of behavior over space, who they're spending time with, where they're spending it, uh, and in what sort of activity. Um, another very important need for modeling with smartphones is the capacity to understand better choice patient choice or individual choice as it comes to, say, physical activity, um, nutritional intake, and day-to-day -day life. Um, choice researchers um, have studied two types of data relating to, uh, to studying how people make decisions. 
And there's a large literature in the management sciences, particularly in marketing, that has to do with um, characterizing how people make decisions and how that reflects their preferences. And uh, a growing amount of understanding here is influenced by uh, Kahneman and Tversky's perspective on different modes of thinking. There's kind of uh, discursive thinking um, th that's uh, reflective and uh, that, that focuses on reasoning things through. And then there's fast thinking, which makes, makes heuristic decisions very quickly to try to, um, to, try to make do in, in, um, in situations that, uh, uh, that come up frequently. Um, but modeling choice data, there's two basic types of data which choice researchers make use of. They talk about data that's revealed preference data. That's data what I actually buy. Traditionally evidenced with things like point of sale records. What am I buying over time? What foods am I buying over time? And we can use revealed choice data together with smartphones in a big way. Because we can look how often people are they exercising? How often are they engaged in moderate to vigorous physical activity or sedentary behavior? And how does that vary based on the environments in which they're located? Right? Are, when they're in an environment that provides more walkability, are they in fact engaging in those sort of behaviors? That's revealed preference data. Are they in fact engaging this? Or when they're in areas that offer healthy food options, think Marcus Hall, <laughs> are they in fact making use of healthy food options? Or does, ladies and gentlemen, the pizza table beckon even yet? <laughs> um, the siren of the pizza table. Um, so here we can, using tools like smartphones, we can look when do people engage in certain health behaviors. And we can do so across some of those areas that are hardest to gather information on traditionally. You know, aspects of their physical activity, sedentary behavior, um, taking into account their location, um, taking into account their social context with other participants. How are they making decisions? Taking into account potentially their social support behavior in, in terms of phone calls or SMS messages if we wish to do so. Using tools like Ethica, these are just things you enable for a given study, and you can get an understanding of certain aspects of their context, communicational, physical location, social context, physical activity context, food environment, by linking up their location with the food outputs nearby or with the walkability of the nearby environment for physical, for built environment. And, and we can understand how does their behavior reflect that environment, right? How is it shaped by that environment? This is a lot of what uh, revealed preference data um, is used to study. How do my choice contexts end up shaping my behavior so that we can get insight into what are my preferences. How do I make decisions, how do I tend to make decisions given the choices available to, uh, to me, how do I choose? So if I'm in an environment which offers very little opportunities for moderate to vigorous physical activity, it won't be surprising that I'm not engaged in moderate to vigorous physical activity. But if I'm in an environment which does offer that walking desk, and I'm not taking advantage, that tells me something about my choice, that my choice architecture. That's one type of behavior, revealed preference data. Um, and there's a whole, there's a whole sub-literature for studying that within the marketing science. Um, we've used it with agent-based models to very good effect, incidentally. Um, but secondly, there's, there's stated preference data. This is data where you actually pose counterfactual questions. You'll actually ask, and, and one of the, the most effective ways of doing this is what's called best worst scaling. So you'll ask people to classify on a list of pos So you present them with different possible scenarios, and you ask, which of these would be most attractive, which will be least attractive? And you do so with different combinations of different counterfactual possibilities, and you ask, how would they choose there? There too, 
Smartphones are a really effective tool because it allows these to be divided into bite-sized chunks. Um, so understanding choice, choice on the part of a patient, choice on the part of a, of a, a participant, Smartphones and wearables can be almost ideal for studying aspects of decision making and choice and how it's affected by the surrounding environment in a way that's contextualized. So it's one of the sort of what I think of as, as a core sort of benefit associated with these techniques. And we can recognize features that stand out of us. Again, this is stimulating theorizing. This is data from a study we ran with e-cigarettes and cigarettes. Um, here with researchers uh, Erica Penz and uh, Brienne uh, Filipenko of, of Respirology. And we looked at, on the one hand, periods of vaping, th that's shown in this, uh, this reddish color. And secondly, periods of smoking, when people reported smoking. And these are people who reported vaping and smoking. They recruited them for that at, at study entry. And smoking is shown in this purplish, vaping is shown in the red. And looking at this data, there was something that just struck me directly from it. You see very different patterns of smoking and vaping. And one of the most profound differences is you tend to see vaping going on for long periods of time successively. Where smoking, it, it does occur, and there, there are groups of smokers and clustering. Maybe this is, you know, they were together with a bunch of fellow smokers. It was a, maybe it was an evening soiree, a smoking soiree. Um, uh, but, but it tends to be episodic. The cigarettes burn down, and you're done with the cigarette. And there's a very defined kind of end to a cigarette that forces you to choose, do I use another, or is this it? Um, with vaping, you can just vape and vape and vape and vape, and a lot of people would. And there's some of these individuals were doing so while engaging in computer gaming, and they would just sit there for hours vaping, 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 vaping while playing this this game. Um, and and you see very different patterns. You can only imagine the impacts these patterns could have on tolerance levels, build up of of tolerance for nicotine, and therefore a greater need for nicotine to kind of maintain that tolerance. Um, but it's one of the ways in which data from big data can stimulate um, hy hypotheses that could then be investigated, such as by then extending Chin Yang's excellent e-cigarette use model to capture dynamics of nicotine uh, levels in the body, which she will leave for a later student. Um, you can also recognize where people are smoking or vaping and what causes it. So, so this is the uh, same study. What prompted people to use an e-cigarette versus uh, a cigarette, for example? Um, uh, or, or where they were using it at, at a functional level, at work, at social events, home, et cetera. Um, and we can use these to, to understand why, what decisions people are making in what context and to some degree, why, narratively. Mm -hmm. um, a final use that I'll just highlight is in, as, as playing to the strengths of smartphone-mediated data collection and, and collection with wearables is understanding device-mediated behaviors, exposures, and, and communication. Um, so the idea here is that, look, um, uh, there's a lot of our interactions with the external world and the electronic world that are funneled through this device. Um, and we can use the device, therefore, to understand some aspects of their, of their interactions with the external, uh, external world. We can, for example, probe aspects to what degree are they using the phone um, on a regular basis. What's their screen time? What's their use of certain apps? What's their level of, of social support as indicated perhaps with text messages that are coming in or going out? What's their level of interaction with that communicational behavior? Say for a child with, with autism, 
or an individual who's, uh, who, who goes through periods of depression. Um, we might use that as an indicator for their level of social engagement, for example. Um, so there's a lot of things funneled through the phone, whether it's browsing behavior, whether it's aspects of their app use, or aspects of their screen use, or aspects of their, be, uh, their um, checking um, the, uh, the outcomes of health behaviors, weighing themselves, and recording it on the phone, that, um, that we can study effectively using, using smartphone and wearable based data collection. Um, so the, measure, the device gives us a clue on their physical world context and their e-world context and their interaction with different particular modes of social interaction and, uh, and health information seeking, uh, et cetera. So, so smartphones used in this way, smartphones wearables, can provide understanding of health behaviors, exposures, and all the attitudes, beliefs at multiple levels of scale. Um, at, the, at the individual level, it can give kind of a more perfect mirror of what's going on to the person, to the participant, or uh, for us as researchers, in often a low burden way, understanding, say, their exposures. Um, we can understand for this particular person what's going on their care behaviors, their self-care network, self-care and informal care networks. And we can use that to inform their care, caregivers. Say for a child with autism, the carers for them and their family to better understand the needs of that child. So at the, at the individual level, at the level of informal care networks, it can be a very powerful tool for understanding the risk factors, the progression, whether there might be risk of incipient depression based on changes in mobility patterns, changes in socialization patterns, changes associated with sedentary behavior, uh, and changes uh, associated with their day sleep cycle, et cetera. It can also be used at the level of clinical management. Um, helping a, cl a clinician and allied health professionals understand the challenges this particular patient is facing. Say with, with uh, uh, COPD-related exacerbations, the fact that they um, are subject to large amounts of coughing under certain situations. Or say for a child with asthma, maybe a pre-verbal child with asthma, what tends to set off their asthma? Like what exposures recently? Is it does it tend to be driven by exposure to extreme cold? We do have a thing called here in Saskatchewan, cold. Cold. Um, uh, and, or is it significantly driven by social context? Um, is it driven by aspects of exposure to certain lower quality air environments? Maybe it's a bus, you know, a bus stop uh, with diesel fumes, or maybe it's aspects of ambient air quality for regions of the city the child is located in. Um, we can start to assess these things. We can look at how does it relate to physical activity. Do they golf and wheeze following uh, you know, period bouts of physical activity? We have all the information we can gather from smartphones and wearables. We can put it into time series and look at how does it trigger these things using tools like recurrent events analysis. Um, which uh, my, of which my students have, uh, have enjoyed some facility. Um, and, and we can look at when symptoms occur in the context that are associated with those symptoms and work towards a more causal understanding uh, using tools like CCM. For health services delivery, we can understand better inefficiencies and bottlenecks delays in the system, um, and identify coordination challenges. I want to pose to you a perspective that I took several years ago, probably four or five years ago now, which has really been borne out by um, progress since then. And that's the notion that, look, if you are trying to understand health burdens in a population or health risks, you're trying to understand within a larger facility aspects of delays, bottlenecks, et cetera. It may be that you can get away with having a small number of sentinels 
actually carrying a phone with Ethica or, or carrying wearables and pick up signals from that small sub subgroup and, and generalize. And it turns out this technique has been picked up now by researchers and big companies like Google to do a very effective translation of that into value. An example, I don't know if you've ever noticed, uh, I don't know how many of you use um, uh, Google Maps, but if you travel with Google Maps, you'll notice that it highlights, if you're, say, driving, it'll highlight regions of your route that are congested, that are associated with congestion. And you may wonder, how, how would they know where it's congested? You know, does the city provide them congestion data based on city cameras? Nothing so sophisticated. Basically, there's lots of people who use Google Maps. Well, what of it? Well, those people using Google Maps are kind of, tr you know, just as we illuminate the flow of, of food through our gut, you know, with, with uh, not just with endos endoscopy, but we use uh, radioactive bolus we swallow, right? And it goes down, and we can trace as it goes through the system. So it is that, that those using Google Maps are kind of this, well, I don't know if they'd like me to say, radioactive bolus. In the, in the body politic of, of the city, you know. Um, they go through the traffic, and yes, they're depending on Google Maps to tell them where the traffic is bad, but they are providing information about their speed of travel back to the mother ship. And Google uses that information to figure out where the slowdowns are. Because for those people who are using Google Maps tend to go slow at certain places, probably it means others will have to go slow. So they can figure out where the bottlenecks are, where the inefficiencies, not by instrumenting the whole city, not by having everyone you know, report in information, but by having a comparatively small subset of the population traveling at different times and looking where do they travel fast and where are they stuck, where are they slowing down. So here, within the context of studies or within the context of health service delivery, operational quality improvement mechanisms, you can actually, through a smaller subset of individuals, capture sentinel behavior that can allow you to, to probe what might be going on in the surrounding environment. Because, ladies and gentlemen, if you look at the state space of the underlying system, well, in principle, this, you know, we could have all sorts of state. There's such huge correlations. If I'm a car and I'm driving a certain way, my situation is going to be highly correlated with the situation around me. And the system tends to be in a small, thin manifold of its possibilities, much as we saw earlier with that um, hair and links example. Although there's all sorts of possibilities in the system, it's only exercising a thin set of them that are logically consistent. And, and there's a logic of the system that keeps it within this manifold. And so it is with traffic and so on. I can, by looking at one person, I can infer a lot about the people around them. By having a small set of sentinels who report foodborne illness symptoms, we may be able to know something, including symptoms that don't bring them to a clinician which are the vast majority, we might know something about the exposures of other people in the population. Or if we can capture flu illness you know, on a small subset of the population, we can use it to infer about what the burden of illness might be more broadly. That is a kernel of an idea that's being exploited now by, by researchers. And it's non-trivial in its implication, because now you have to deal with not just sampling people, but sampling network connections, et cetera. But there's, uh, there's a tremendous amount of value that can be gained, in short, even if you're only instrumenting a small subset into the broader situation, much as that bolus illuminates our G GI system function. Um, at a public health level, uh, there's opportunities for faster outbreak identification, localization, control, control strategies, prioritizing advisories, um, and uh, in certain types of testing, et cetera. And at the level of strategic decision making, policy setting, and, and deciding, evaluating new, new forms of intervention regimes. So I provided you, ladies and gentlemen, a bit of a picture 
for why we believe and why we have invested uh, so heavily to support the use of smartphones and wearables as data collection tools in health. Smartphones and wearables are not merely a convenient means of collecting this information, but a potent way of nudging individuals and a way of broader, more broadly illuminating the system around us. Uh, we can use them to gather information about our doings and froings in the physical world and our context in the physical world, but a tremendous amount of the value comes from the digital shadows that they catch, that they, that they throw, and the, um, they cast, and, uh, and the influences from the digital world and the physical world that are mediated by the smartphone and, and by wearables that accompany it. For these reasons, and because of the incredibly high velocity, high variety, and high veracity data um, that come from smartphones, in a world that's increasingly, um, increasingly limited as to availability of traditional data, and concerning factors that are traditionally hard to measure, I believe that smartphones and wearables offer a, uh, a type of data collection of profound significance for data science and for system data science, the synthesis of both um, that, that we're talking about here, where we ground our models, inform our models, drive our models in some cases, and filter our models using data um, gathered from such rich uh, sources, okay? So um, those are my comments on the third and indeed the final um, data source exemplar we'll be talking about this week. But it's one that will play a role in some of the case studies. Uh, and uh, as time allows, we'll also do some explorations with, um, with some primary data collection within this area ourselves. Um, any questions related to this before I, I stop the recording here? Yes, sure. You talked about it, but I, it's probably worth just going back to it again. The idea of the, the, the timeliness of this data and how much potential it has to influence decision making in a way that is actually useful mm. compared to most of the traditional data sources. Even if you're asking, even if it's electronic, even if you're asking somebody to sit down, find time to sit down and enter something on their computer, Right? There's a delay. Yes. Right? That's right. If they're working off their phone, this is instantaneous, it's going someplace that can easily can either come back to them as an immediate feedback on their behavior right. or can influence some sort of higher level systems administrative or policy decision the same easily within the same day if yep. if, if the system was set up to, to accommodate that. And I'm not sure that there's there's been the recognition of mm. the, the, the power of, mm. of that timeliness piece. I mean, think of all the millions of dollars that go into surveillance each year in this country, and the fact that typically we get our reports three, four, five years after that data has been collected, and then it's retrospectively used to. Yeah. Driving, looking out your back, rear view mirror. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's, there's a real paradigm shifting thing going on here in terms yeah. of having this data come in, you know, especially if it's going into sort of, you know, mm. being you know, paired with modeling or whatever in terms yeah. of actually informing decision making. So oh. uh, it just, it's, uh, I guess, something that we, we recognize, but I, I'm not sure that it's, it's, it's necessarily recognized by the broader community how much, how much influence that could actually have. It's a very good point. Um, I, I mean, your points are, <laughs> are invariably uh, spot on and, and really insightful, and, and this one is no exception. I really appreciate uh, you know, the, the, the acuity of that. Um, and I think you're, you're right. I mean, and and it's, it's made possible not just because we carry the phone around with us, with us right, um, that, that we carry it broadly, but it's, it's partly because we can ask it, because we carry it broadly, we can ask it at 
you know, certain times um, uh, of the day in a, in a lower burden light, but also because we can trigger some of these questions at times that are more intelligent. And one of the areas where we're going with Ethica is um, to be able to trigger them in a more judicious way in terms of not bothering the person when it's obviously not a good time, right? Um, you know, so if they're driving, for example, we don't want to be asking them a question right now. Or if they're in the middle of, you know, rushing around, it's probably not a great time to pop that question. Um, by contrast, um, there may be uh, good points at which, for this person's patterns, they've demonstrated, you know, reliable that they can answer questions. And there's also just times that are that are timely. They're timely because they're proximate to the point of interest, right? Like, so you're there's a, there's an interesting um, set of findings involving patient satisfaction, and where they compare patient satisfaction as he listed it at the point of care, you know, having seen the physician versus in retrospective recall. My understanding from those who have studied that literature is a profound difference between what is recalled after the fact with, um, you know, with the, the sort of recall bias and, and uh, other factors playing a role versus when you're at that point of care. And asking the question, when it is fresh in your mind, when it's, um, um, when it's immediate, um, when you've perhaps just made that decision or just been exposed to this situation or what have you, yes, it can lead to much more significant, um, uh, much more accurate data, but it can also lead to more timely data as far as reporting, right? So uh, point of care being a, being one example, but um, potentially, I mean, we're looking at things like in our group, we use uh, deep learning algorithms, um, for example, for recognition of symptoms. Coughing, snoring, um, crying, uh, babies crying. Um, uh, we, we've used them uh, to try to recognize a growing number of health behaviors in addition to things like eating. How do we know when someone's eating? Um, if we can use that recognition on the phone to trigger a question, it doesn't always have to be right, right? I mean, maybe, maybe we think someone's eating, but actually they're just sitting there with a cup of coffee and someone else is eating uh, that they're accompanying. But if we can be much more likely to have a judiciously chosen question um, if we can be more likely to have asked it at the right time, we're more likely to have a reliable answer and a timely answer, one that doesn't require, you know, were you sick sometime in the past week? But, you know, allow that elucidation now. And of course, part of that is you've explored very successfully in, in your uh, well-designed studies is being able to allow people to proactively report it. You know, it's just a touch of a button. I'm, I'm feeling sick today. And, and that, that doesn't even require inference. So, yes, I think you're right that the, the timeliness, which is supported by the device and the fact that it has recourse to sensor data, but is further supported by the fact the phone is with them, it's easy to use, it's carried around a lot, um, it, it's lower burdensome because they're interacting with it a lot anyway, um, it, it supports uh, things like audiovisual questions, audio recording, as you used in your study for you know what people are eating, maybe being simpler than describing it, um, and and these are things that that can allow yes very rapid um, reporting and very rapid um, linkage to models. So you're right. Um, that's a world apart from. The, um, the delayed nature of data that we get through other public health data sources, um, and particularly you know, sources from, um, from federal government or what have you that may be years, um, years old, as you say, by the time that we get them. Some of the more interesting studies that have been done with dynamic models involving people's decision making and how, the, how well they effectively make decisions with simple dynamic, simple dynamic model sounds 
like an oxymoron, but uh, descriptively simple dynamic models. Um, one of the things that it's shown is one of the factors where people are m poorest at controlling them, and in fact where controllability as a theoretical construct is low, is when there's long delays. And to make effective decisions is much harder when we're dealing with trying to drive looking at our back or rear view mirror. How, you know, you can only imagine the challenges if you had no front windshield and you relied on your back, back mirror to try to drive forward. You're not gonna do so well, right? Because of that delay between seeing what's ahead until it gets behind you, you can't take it into account. You'd be in a bad straits. And the truth is that when we have long delays, at best, we tend to, to respond and over, o overly respond. It's kind of like fishtailing on that icy road, or um, we tend to, we tend to, you know, have very poorly controlled responses that are not very effective at dealing with the situation. So, in as much as data feeds into models and can inform it, more timely data, such as measured through smartphones and such as supported fairly well by Ethica, recognizing Ethica runs without requirement for connectivity. Um, it can run uh, offline as well. That's, that is a real asset. So I agree completely with you. For accuracy of the report, completeness of the report, low burden, um, informing practical decision making, uh, timeliness is king or queen. Yeah. We're just going to do it for lunch. Indeed. Um, uh, Levy? Um, sorry, when you're talking about the long delay yeah. in your analogy of driving, yes. so it was like, were you saying that we don't have information in time t, which is at the current time we're looking at, but we only have the information of time t, you know, the previous time? That's right. And we try to um, like predict what's happening in time t plus one. That's so correct. And there's a, there's a, a whole sub-area of modeling, um, uh, which is, um, it, it, it goes by the name control theory, and it has to do with um, automated regulation of systems using computational mathematical tools. Um, and it reflects the fact that all around us, um, there are systems that, that need to be in balance or homeostasis or at, at, at achieve effective regulation, whether it's an airplane and keeping it you know, flying um, in a stable way, um, despite in some cases like fighter jets being aerodynamically unstable, um, or whether it's aspects of the room and the temperature in a room needing to be regulated so it's within a certain range or any number of different situations. Um, our bodies and the systems around us require being in a sort of equilibrium or stasis and they have regulatory regimes that keep them there. But in, in control theory, you can have real problems with effective control when you're dealing with delayed measurements. Because as I say, it's a bit like trying to drive, look at the rear view mirror. You know, you're, you're operating off of information that's outdated and therefore, and, and it's getting increasingly, um, increasingly, you know, sometimes it's becoming increasingly irrelevant and, um, and you're having to make decisions. And so it tends to be a very hard problem. And this is one of the problems which Forrester in formulating system dynamics um, was grappling with because at that time, you know, people were talking data, 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 data um, about business organizations and so on. And that's all well and good to have, you know, quantitative metrics in your organization. But at that time, they might be months old and you're trying to make decisions based on this data that's months old and you tend to make certain decisions that sometimes worsen the situation because you're, you know, you're continuing a pattern of behavior assuming that data is continuing and you tend to overshoot and then you collapse and 
and it, it becomes, you know, your, your actions tend to, just like the fish tailing on the road, you go too far one way, too far the other way, and you, you end up not driving very effectively. So delays in data have profound impacts on our ability to make effective decisions. And it's one of the reasons, for example, we, we are working with Jin Yang um, back there with particle filtering on mosquito data to have you know, up-to-date decision-making with respect to you know, mosquito counts and hopefully someday uh, West Nile assessment for mosquitoes because you know, recency is king, um, currency is king um, in terms of, of the data and the older it gets, the harder and harder effective regulation of a system like that gets. Yeah. Any other questions? I appreciate Alex uh, noting the time, and we're bumping up against the hour. Is is there is there any other question? Okay, so let's uh, let's break for lunch, and uh, we'll be back here uh, if we can in about an hour. Okay. And I will post these videos. <laughs>